Um, so it's non-existent in the United States, but you can see that it's heavily, heavily concentrated in the tropic areas. And a lot of times these areas are plagued with a, um, a high humidity, high temperature. Um, they're very densely populated. They often have a very low GDP. Um, so a lot of these aid in uh, malaria transmission. But like I said, malaria is uh, spread by a parasite. It's a plasmodium parasite. And there's five species that are capable of infecting humans, and falciparum is the main cause of plasmodium infection. And uh, plasmodium parasite is spread through the bite of a mosquito, um, and once uh, a person is infected with malaria from a mosquito bite, the parasite travels to the liver, where it eventually gets into the blood, where it undergoes an intraerythrocytic cycle. And this cycle is what we study in our lab bind our protein via the, the histidine side chains of the protein, and we're able to purify them out from a blood sample. We're basically just taking solid phase extraction and doing it in a new, fun way. <laughs> um, so if you know anything about solid phase extraction, you have a solid phase, you're binding your analyte to that solid phase, using a mobile phase to wash away any type of interferent or contaminant, and then you release that analyte for further use. So basically what we designed is a self-contained cassette that does that but we're giving the solid phase motion so that we're able to do the extraction. We're able to take that protein, extract it from blood, purify it away from contaminants, and then release it for later use. Excuse me, giving me the opportunity to come and talk to you guys about some of the work that we're doing uh, in the Marnette Lab now, uh, looking at endogenously formed uh, lipid electrophiles and how they interact with uh, the proteins in our bodies. And so during uh, inflammation, both chronic and acute inflammation, massive amounts of cellular oxidants are generated. And so we're really interested in how this affects polyunsaturated fatty acids. And so all polyunsaturated fatty acids have this disallylic group here. And so we've recently published a very comprehensive uh, overview of both hydroxynoninal and oxynoninal, their targets of adduction in two different cell lines, and I'm gonna highlight some of the differences that we see from that. So how are we going to study these in an endogenous setting? And so what we have is we've developed a probe, uh, alkynolinoleic acid, to actually study this. And so the, the difference from native linoleic acid is just this alkyne at the end here. And we've recently shown that uh, you can actually take this alkynol fatty acid, enrich it into cells, uh, into the lipid bilayer, and it's metabolized both in an autox fashion and by lipoxygenases in a similar manner to the native fatty acid. And so what we can do is we can take and enrich the cells with this, and then we can induce electrophile formation. And so here we have a, an electrophile adductive protein. And then using classic, the classical click chemistry reaction, we can attach, selectively attach this biotinylated probe uh, to the protein. And then we can use streptadenin-based fluorophores to visualize the extent of adduction across the proteome. So uh, these two compounds were identified by the Schneider Lab in 2011 as a result of a COX-mediated oxidation of 5S-HETE. Additionally, these compounds provide some evidence that there is a crossover pathway between the COX-2 and 5 locks and the MAG pathways. Uh, and why is that important? Well, these could potentially have a role in importance in, in, importance in human health. Um, so when you think about 5 locks and COX-2, you often think of uh, inflammatory pathways and tissue repair and homeostasis. Um, so we're wondering if potentially these compounds could have some therapeutic value in starting the inflammatory pathway or being uh, part of the resolution of the inflammatory pathway. Additionally, if these compounds are present in disease states uh, or are upregulated in disease states, then maybe they could be potential biomarkers. So traditionally, it's believed that from arachidonic acid, um, the initial oxidation of arachidonic acid determines which lipid mediator is going to be biosynthesized. So if erectonic acid is acted upon by cyclooxygenase 2, COX-2, you'll arrive at PGG-2, an unstable intermediate which is uh, quickly reduced to PGH-2. And this serves as a starting point for synthesis of a variety of different prostaglandins and thromboxanes. However, if it is instead oxidized by 5-epoxygenase, you'll arrive at 5-SHPET, which can then be transformed into LTA-4, which is the precursor for the remainder of the group of trines, but additionally, you can also form uh, 5S HETE, which was long assumed to be just a byproduct of this biosynthetic pathway. Uh, 
guys by the name of Otto Warburg, first identified the fact that cancer cells take up glucose at a rate much higher than normally differentiated tissue. And he also recognized that while this process was going on, these, still, these cells still maintained a high level of oxidative metabolism. Um, this fact became, this observation was you know, held up for years, and it's now known as the Warburg effect after him. And in fact, we take advantage of this phenotype all the time, right, with things like PET imaging, where real life cancer is taking up, you know, radio-labeled glucose and then to image a solid tumor. This, uh, aside from PET imaging, this phenotype really laid pretty dormant for a long time until it was recognized that prominent oncogenes actually regulate these metabolic irregularities. Uh, one I want to highlight this morning, or this afternoon, is uh, AKT, uh, shown here. So AKT is a pretty interesting serine reading kinase with respect to cellular metabolism because it phosphorylates the glucose transporter and it also phosphorylates or uh, activates hexokinase 2. Uh, it turns out that in the last couple of years, so we found there's a couple other systemic mutations that really prevents uh, those carbons from glucose entering the TCA cycle. Mutations to things like pyruvate kinase. So in other words, these cancer cells have rewired their metabolic processes to actually feed their biosynthetic pathways through glucose. Now, this is a great observation, so you can say that these oncogenes are regulating this phenotype, but how do you exploit it for treatment? So it turns out to be really difficult. Um, so if you directly target those oncogenes, it turns out they play really important roles in normally differentiated tissues as well, right? So if you try to target AKT, there's a lot of so-called on-target side effects, and that's held up drugs like MK2206 in the clinic. So as I mentioned, uh, the N-terminal fragment of MOL, which is contained in all MOL fusion proteins, uh, associates with the histone uh, through binding with menin. Uh, so if you look at menin, uh, shown here on the left, and if you think of it as uh, an open hand, in the palm region is a deep central cavity uh, where the MOL peptide is able to associate. Uh, and this is shown in the upper right with the MOL peptide in green. Um, and so this deep pocket represents a potential therapeutic uh, target uh, for the use of small molecule inhibitors of menin and MOL interaction. Um, there's been a large body of work um, I'm looking at this as a potential uh, therapeutic for mixing lineage leukemia. Um, however, at this point, uh, the lack of uh, small molecules uh, used for in vivo studies has kind of uh, hindered some of that research. Uh, so our lab is interested in identifying novel small molecule inhibitors in NML interaction. Uh, we began this with a high throughput screen uh, conducted by uh, the NIH with the MLPCN. Uh, we screened uh, 300,000 members of small, uh, library of small molecules uh, using a fluorescence polarization assay. Um, and of these 300,000 compounds, we had uh, 62 uh, initial confirmed hits. Um, and then the Grebeck lab at Michigan uh, took those hits and further validated them with uh, saturation transfer difference uh, NMR uh, to arrive at several novel classes of small molecule inhibitors. And today, I'm going to tell you how we use MMR to look at arresting conformational changes upon receptor binding. So the receptor I'm talking about here is a G-protein coupled receptor. As you can see, it has seven transmembrane helices, and as a receptor, it's embedded in the lipid bilayer and transduct the signal from the outside to inside the cell. There are more than 800 unique GPCRs in the human genome, and they respond to strictly diverse stimulations from a single photon to ions like calcium, all the way up to proteins like interleukins, so that they modulate a wide range of physiological processes such as vision, blood pressure, mood control, and so on. So not surprisingly, they are targeted by more than 50% of the therapeutic drug in the market. So, Arrestin is one of the three major protein family that interact with the GPCRs. So first of all, in the low affinity binding state, what are the structural elements of arresting that can recognize receptor active conformation and the receptor, active, uh, receptor attached phosphates, respectively? Second, what, what is the conformation of arresting in the high receptor binding affinity state? To look into these two questions, I chose to use Rodaptin as a model GPCR for my study.